Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. American voters are hours away from a historic home stretch. One final day to choose a president. After a tumultuous four years, the top of their ballots featured two candidates and one stark choice. Republicans say Donald Trump will make America great again. Again. But Democrats say that one term is quite enough of that, and Joe Biden will bring America back. One more day. Tomorrow we are going to win the state. It has been a bitter campaign during a pandemic, in part about one. Now voters will speak. They are itching to see what happens, and Canadians are too. So tonight, let's get you ready. This is a special edition of The National. For Donald Trump, it is about a second term, a win to match the success of his three immediate predecessors. For Joe Biden, it is about breaking Trump's hold and becoming the oldest person ever elected U.S. president. For Americans, the direction of their country is at stake. So for us, tonight is all about a dramatic election eve. Our reporters are ready in the key states. Ian will take us through the electoral map. And we'll freshen up those Bush versus Gore lessons. And as the clock ticks down, we'll hear from voters and insiders. But let's start right at the heart of things with the candidates themselves. Out on the trail one final day. Nearly 100 million Americans have already voted. That may not be a good thing for Donald Trump. And as Paul Hunter shows us, in the final hours before the final vote, the U.S. president has put on a roadshow as familiar as it is frenetic. By the size of the crowd tonight in Michigan, you'd never know it, but, say the polls, Donald Trump is losing. Oh, wow. This is a big crowd. And if those polls are correct, he will lose tomorrow, even after today's string of last-minute jam-packed rallies. We have five of these today, five. Five rallies in four crucial battleground states for Trump today. This one's North Carolina. At each, a key message for voters. Tomorrow you have the power to do so much for our country. You have the power to vote. So go out and vote. He even went to Joe Biden's hometown of Scranton, Pennsylvania, a vital state for both candidates, a state Trump won in 2016, but where he now trails Biden. Thank you very much. Even if Thank he doesn't you. like to acknowledge it. This does not look like a second place finish. Fact is, to win re-election, Trump needs the kind of political upset not seen since the last election when he surprised the planet with a last-minute win over Hillary Clinton. With an eye on that today, Trump took brutal aim at Biden. But this guy is a stone-cold phony, and, and honestly, he's not equipped mentally to be your president. He really is. More significantly, Trump also continued to suggest he may challenge the results of tomorrow's vote in court, especially in places where counting ballots may take days, for example, Pennsylvania. You know what can happen? Number one, cheating can happen like you've never seen. This is their dream. We'll make America great again. Trump's dream tonight is said to be to absolutely avoid losing. But with no one really knowing how far he'll go on that if the numbers don't fall his way. All right, Paul, so let's talk about that for a moment. Talk to us about Trump's plan if the vote counts disappoint him. Well, the signals are that Trump will go hard on this and push back against, for example, the delays that have been allowed for the counting of mail-in ballots in Pennsylvania, ballots believed to benefit Biden. It's a battle that could go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. As Trump has put it, we're going in with our lawyers. Adrian. All right. Paul Hunter in Washington. Thanks, Paul. Joe Biden also campaigned heavily today, hoping to expand his path to victory. Susan Ormiston is in Wilmington, Delaware, steps from Biden's campaign headquarters, where the plan, apparently, is to take nothing for granted. Swoop, the mascot, and the Philadelphia Eagles cheerleaders making it easy to drive in your ballot. Fred Smith's a Biden guy. I, I know he can win. I know he can win. He's the man. 
Can I just see the back of your ballot? Nancy Gafford says she voted Republican last time. This election? What are you looking for in a president then? One that's really serious about what's going on. Like, you know, this pandemic. Um, it's really a big thing. Joe Biden's entire campaign has been carved out by COVID, by clobbering President Trump for mishandling it. And last night, Trump said he was going to fire Dr. Fauci. Isn't that wonderful? I got a better idea. Elect me and I'm going to hire Dr. Fauci. Not, and we're going to fire Donald Trump. Joe Biden is on his third try to be president, and he's never been closer, leading in national polls in some key battleground states, in spite of Trump's mocking him as Sleepy Joe in his basement. Joe Biden ran a campaign that was almost subterranean, but it was smart because the more time that Biden ceded to Donald Trump, the more voters were reminded of what they would get for another four years if they reelected Donald Trump. Pollsters conclude Biden has more paths to win than Trump, but Democrats are nervous. In 2016, state polls failed to pick up a late campaign shift and Trump is seeding doubts about ballots counted after election day. Our response is the president's not gonna steal this election. And tonight in Pittsburgh, for Joe Biden, some star power, Lady Gaga. We need your heart. Vote like your life depends on it. Okay, now, Susan, uh, we've just heard about how Trump could try to claim victory, whether or not the results actually support that tomorrow night. Is the Biden campaign prepared for that scenario? Oh, yes. The campaign is saying today under no scenario will Donald Trump be elected a victor on election night. That legal ballots counted after midnight as usual are valid and any attempt to stop that vote will be roundly challenged. They're also telling us to expect Joe Biden to address the nation tomorrow night from here in Wilmington in some fashion and probably, Andrew, very late. Susan Ormiston, thank you very much. So tomorrow night, you will hear a lot about the map. That is because tomorrow is not about the popular vote count. It's about which way the majority of voters in each state breaks. Red or blue, winner takes all. And how much each state is worth in the electoral college. So essentially a scoreboard where a candidate needs to reach 270 to win. That is what Ian will be tracking. So Ian, firstly, so nice to see you. A little far away, but <laughs> glad you're here. Uh, walk us through what you're looking at. And great to be here as well. So let's look at the 2016 map to give you an indication of what I'll be looking at tomorrow night. In 2016, Donald Trump won the states you'd expect a Republican candidate to win, the Deep South, Texas, for example, but also some that he was probably the only person that thought he would win, uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan. Those are states that reliably were Democratic for a long Long, long time. Anyone, Florida, famous for a couple of things on election night, usually being close, and usually the candidate that wins there wins the White House. So we'll be looking at that. And Adrian, if it is Pennsylvania that is hanging in the balance, it could be days before we have a final result of this election. Okay, it's a long one. I will bring snacks, but before you go, talk to me if you can about the Senate. Yeah, so the Senate in the United States obviously different than ours. Members clearly elected, and as we saw with the Supreme Court confirmations, the Senate wields significant power. And so if the Democrats want control of the Senate, they have to have a net gain of four seats. If Biden doesn't win the White House, three if he does. And no matter what happens tomorrow night in the Senate, there almost certainly will be some new faces. And they'll have a big impact on politics in the United States and by extension, depending on their policies, on Canada as well. All right, Ian, thanks very much. Well, in the final hours leading to Election Day, there are very visible signs of concern that things could get out of hand. Check out the scene in Washington. Businesses and other buildings boarding up windows. As Stephen D'Souza shows us, that precautionary sense of dread is felt across the country, even as officials give assurances voters will be protected. Tell me, baby, are you done talking yet? In Pennsylvania, they're trying to get voters into the groove encouraging turnout in a state that's seen as crucial to the final result. We know that there are some data that's coming in that shows that um, we really have some work to do in the black community, particularly to get our folks to the polls. Across the country, tension around election day is mounting. Fears of voter intimidation and violence at polling places considered a real threat. This is the cradle of liberty and nobody 
is going to steal that from us. Tomorrow. In Philadelphia today, a strong message from the mayor, police chief, and district attorney. So if you are planning in Philadelphia to try to steal our votes, I got something for you. I got a jail cell. I have charging papers. The warning comes after the president praised supporters in Texas who surrounded a Biden campaign bus on a highway between Austin and San Antonio on Friday. Biden officials accused the supporters of trying to run them off the road. They were forced to cancel a campaign stop. The FBI is now investigating. In another incident on Saturday, police in North Carolina pepper sprayed a crowd marching to the polls to honor the black Americans whose deaths fueled this summer's protests over racial injustice. This is the drop box, right? At this quiet voting place, people were mixed about whether voter intimidation was a threat. With the current administration, he has emboldened his supporters to act that way, um, which is unfortunate. I'm more concerned with when we will actually get the results of the election. I'll be out and about. This local pastor says he's using the threats as motivation. I get encouraged because that says that there's power in our votes and you are afraid of us voting. And if you are afraid of us voting, then I'm even more encouraged to vote. A sentiment he's counting on to inspire voters with hope, not fear, when they go to the polls tomorrow. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Philadelphia. And so obviously lots of interest in this country as well. Rosie Barton, our chief political correspondent, is here to fill us in on that. So Rosie, how is Canada's government preparing? Well, over the past week, Adrian, the government's gone back to some of its sort of regular advisors on Canada-U.S. relations to get a sense of what's happening on the ground and then eventually how to respond. Last week, the Prime Minister spoke to our ambassador to the U.S., Kirsten Hillman, as well as uh, the Canadian Consul's General in the U.S. He's also been speaking to former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, who, of course, helped his government navigate this relationship before and during uh, NAFTA. But obviously, the government's preparing for every eventuality here. In fact, it's fair to say, though, that they are better prepared than they were at the last presidential election, if only because they know both of these candidates now. There's some nervousness, obviously, about how this will all unfold, but a fair amount of confidence that regardless of the outcome, you know, it, it will be okay. Are there particular, I mean, I, I'm sure there are lots of them, but what yeah. are the issues of particular concern? You know, trade is obviously going to continue to be a challenge for Canada. It's just a matter of whether there's going to be more predictability in that going forward. But I would say that that is sort of the common concern, whether it's under a Biden or a Trump administration, is what American protectionism is going to look like going forward. We've seen the impact under Donald Trump, the propensity to uh, impose tariffs on, on Canadian products with no rhyme or reason. And we know Joe Biden, of course, is promising Buy American policies for procurement. So lots still to consider, no matter who ends up being president tomorrow night or whatever night this actually ends. <laughs> or weeks from now, That's who right. knows. <laughs> All right, Rosie, thanks for this. Lots to talk about in the days and maybe weeks ahead. Thanks, Adrian. So tomorrow night, as one of the largest and oldest democracies puts itself to the test in extraordinary times, the National has everything you'll need. Our team is ready to go the distance with a rolling news special. What a great victory we had. And we're going to have an even bigger victory. Get out there and vote. I believe when you use your power, the power to vote, you can change the course of the country. And when those votes are counted, CBC News will have the numbers, the facts, and the stories shaping election night. Reporters you know and trust will be with Trump and Biden and in the key states that could decide the presidency with the sharpest analysis of what's coming. I'm Kelly Jane Torrance, editorial board member at the New York Post. This is David Frum, writer at The Atlantic and author of two books on the Trump presidency. Aisha C. Mills here, where I'll share my Democratic strategist take on everything that's at stake. That is the CBC News U.S. election special tomorrow night and probably into Wednesday, uh, maybe even Thursday and beyond. Okay, let's turn to other news tonight. Beginning with a disturbing event in Austria. Authorities say several people are dead, including a gunman, in what government officials are calling a repulsive terrorist attack. Here's Rene Filipponi with what we know so far. <laughs> Scenes of chaos in central Vienna as frightened crowds fled a series of gunshots. Several people were killed after an unknown number of armed suspects opened fire at six different crime scenes. 
I am grateful that the police managed to shoot one of the suspects, said the Interior Minister, who is calling it a critical situation and is urging people to stay inside. Police continue to search for the other attackers, with several specialized units on the ground. The military has been mobilized to help. The attack began near a synagogue, but it's unclear if it was the target, since it was closed at the time. Tonight, the Austrian chancellor says this is definitely a terrorist attack and admits it's still a relatively confusing situation. This newly arrived Canadian says it's been overwhelming. For four hours now, it's just been constant sirens. Um, I've heard a lot of yelling in the streets, a lot of running. I've been staying away from the window, so I haven't really been looking out to see what's going on. As a precaution, parents are being told to keep their children at home tomorrow. Large parts of the city remain cordoned off as the manhunt continues. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Well, more reaction today from loved ones of those killed in the Quebec City sword attack this weekend. Suzanne Clermont and François Duchesne were killed in the Halloween night attack, which left five others injured. The province announced $100 million in funding for mental health services a week earlier than expected. Now to the pandemic in this country and the second wave that continues to roil across several provinces. Central Canada is still carrying the brunt in numbers of new daily infections, but it's the West that's raising the loudest alarm bells. British Columbia topped a bad weekend with 379 new cases today. Alberta didn't report numbers at all because its data system is undergoing maintenance. So that leaves Saskatchewan continuing its four-day trend of more than 70 cases in Manitoba, where after several rough days, new cases dipped to 241. Manitoba's premier is vowing increased enforcement to bring those numbers down with new restrictions taking effect in Winnipeg. Karen Pauls shows us. This Vietnamese restaurant is usually packed at lunch, but today, Hein Dang is filling just a handful of orders for takeout and delivery. He's worried. How to keep it surviving, like how we can survive during this time. It's a question many are asking as Winnipeg goes into a partial lockdown that looks very much like the worst days last spring. We were beating COVID. Then some of us lost our way and now COVID is beating us. The Premier vowed to crack down on illegal gatherings like the massive Halloween party on the weekend. We're giving serious consideration to implementing a curfew, a curfew that would be designed to restrict travel between key hours. But hundreds of doctors say the province isn't doing enough. One group is calling for a full province-wide lockdown. The other is demanding emergency funding for contact tracing, testing and public education. So we are full right now based on the infections that occurred and the case counts that were occurring one to two weeks ago. We are going to have difficulty being able to care for the patients that come through the door. Public health officials say those concerns are valid. Them speaking out is uh, giving further credence to, uh, to what we're telling Manitobans on just how critical this moment is for us. Hein Dang is already making sacrifices. He's laid off most of his staff. It was tough, really tough. We hope that like everything just like going back to normal um, after two weeks. But that will only happen if everyone else does their part to flatten the curve. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now, as we noted earlier, British Columbia had a rough weekend. New case numbers for each of the last three days are the highest the province has seen so far. Along with 1,100 cases, there were six deaths. The COVID-19 tide is rising. You can see that in the numbers. It is powerful, but we can be stronger and we will be stronger. But despite warnings to keep Halloween gatherings small, this was Saturday night in downtown Vancouver. The health minister described the scene as, quote, very irritating. Well, Ontario's flu shot program has hit a snag. A major pharmacy chain says it has stopped offering the vaccine because of supply issues. But the premier says, don't blame the province. Lauren Pelly explains. Waiting longer is concerning. The flu season theoretically should be starting any day now. 
This Ottawa physician planned to get his whole family vaccinated this week. Then his wife got this email from Rexall. The appointment was cancelled due to a lack of vaccine supply across Ontario. A spokesperson for the pharmacy chain told CBC News its flu shot program is temporarily paused. It is a striking thing to have the cancellation given we were told as a province that this was going to be uh, the biggest flu vaccine campaign in the history of Canada. But demand for the shots also shot up. We're seeing over 500% increase in the number of people looking to receive their flu vaccine from a pharmacy. This year it's important because it's a vital part of our, our pandemic response. Flu shot advocate Jill Promoli lost her two-year-old son Jude to influenza in 2016. It's been disappointing to see how few flu shots were ordered for a province this size. We ordered 5.1 million, that's 700,000 more than last year. On top of that, we ordered another 300,000. As for Rexall, my friends in Rexall, you knew the allocations that you had, so don't overbook people. It's very simple as that. Dr. Yoni Friedhoff fears that kind of breakdown could also impact the rollout of a future coronavirus vaccine. Hopefully there will be lessons learned from this. And a vaccine for COVID-19 might not be that far off. Multiple candidates are now nearing the end of clinical trials. That means policymakers don't have very long to learn from the lessons of this year's flu shot rollout. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Mississauga. A long-awaited trial of a man accused in the death of an Indigenous woman began in Thunder Bay, Ontario today. Cameron McIntosh looks at the impact on her family and the community. Braden Bushby said nothing going into court in Thunder Bay. Do you have anything to say today? We'll all be said in the courtroom. Thank you. On trial for manslaughter in the death of 34-year-old Barbara Kentner, a crime her sisters insist was racially motivated. It's not being prosecuted as a hate crime because they want to do it the way they want to do it. I figured it was. Melissa Kentner says she was walking with her sister early January 29th, 2017, when a car approached. As soon as they seen us walking across the street, that's when that car started proceeding towards us. Someone threw this trailer hitch. Barbara was hit. She died of related injuries six months later. Today, Bushby admitted he threw it, but pleaded not guilty to manslaughter. His lawyer saying there was no racial motivation suggesting Kentner didn't get timely medical attention. The case has caused a lot of anguish in the Indigenous community, which has long complained of violence and racism in the city. In a context of Thunder Bay where native hunting is something that is, you know, well known in the city. Changes to trial law, the pandemic and a courthouse fire led to delays. The original second degree murder charge was downgraded, angering local chiefs. That just baffles everybody, all of us. Who makes these, these, these charges before a court date? No, that, that is very disturbing. We've taken longer to get to this point than anybody really wants to. It's finally happening. I'm happy. You know, three years is a long wait. If convicted, Bushby could receive anything from probation to life in prison. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. All right, back now to our special coverage. Just hours to go until the first polls close in the United States. Ahead on the national what's at stake and what to watch for. Insight from our reporters across the U.S. I'm Paul Hunter. Here's the thing about election night. And analysis from our U.S. political panel. And what if it's too close to call? A warning from the chaos of 2000. If it is not a clear winner, America will have to batten down the hatches. And on the eve of a historic moment, Americans reflect on why they vote. I feel empowered that I finally get to use my voice. We're back in two. Well, here's a look at the White House tonight, protected by layers of security fencing. There are clear skies in Washington tonight, and when it comes to tomorrow's vote, there are some clear signs to watch for as well. We asked our reporters, Paul Hunter, Susan Ormiston, Stephen D'Souza, and Katie Simpson, to take us through some key themes. I'm Paul Hunter. Here's the thing about election night. You can pretty much forget about results in most states. California is going to vote Joe Biden. Kentucky is going to vote for Donald Trump. The ones to watch are those that could go either way, the so-called battlegrounds. And there's a handful of them. I'll give you six. For Trump, 
Keep an eye on Arizona, North Carolina, and especially Florida. If he loses any of those, he's in deep trouble. For Joe Biden, it's the big three up north, Wisconsin, Michigan, and especially Pennsylvania. If he loses any of those, he's in big trouble. Six states to keep an eye on with the White House in the balance. I'm Susan Ormiston. What to watch for key blocks of voters like Latinos in the battleground state of Florida. Have enough moved into the Trump column to sway the result there? Seniors worried about the coronavirus, about health care and Social Security. Biden's been gaining with that group and Trump is trying to lure them back. White suburban women, they helped elect Donald Trump in 2016, but some have moved away. Trump has been trying to get them back, saying just recently, you better love me, and black voters. Biden has more support, but will they turn in enough votes in key states to elect him? The issue of the painful protests for racial justice will be on this ballot. Lots to watch for. I'm Stephen D'Souza. Because of the pandemic, a record number of people have voted early using mail-in ballots. But in key battleground states like Michigan, Wisconsin, and especially Pennsylvania, there have been a number of battles over when those votes will be counted and whether some of them could be rejected. So on election night, be careful about the early results. They may not tell the full story. There also could be a lot of disinformation about mail-in ballots and the vote counting process. That all means that in those key states like Pennsylvania, we may not know the winner for days. I'm Katie Simpson. While the race for the White House is obviously extremely important, so is the battle for control of the Senate. Republicans have a majority and have used it to help the president implement his legislative agenda and most notably to confirm conservative judges and justices. But with the number of Senate races too close to call, it's unclear whether Republicans can hold on to that power. When a party wins both the presidency and the Senate, it becomes easier to get things done. If there's a split, expect intense partisan clashes in this deeply polarized political climate. All right, special coverage continues right after the break. The U.S. political panel is here to set the stage. And later, Johnny Depp loses his libel case. What it could mean for him and future court cases. Welcome back. On the eve of what some are calling the most consequential U.S. election in history, we are convening our U.S. political panel. They are our guides in terms of what to look for tomorrow. Tomorrow. So joining us tonight, Daniel McCarthy, a Republican, editor of Modern Age Journal. Danielle Moody is a Democrat and the host of the podcast Woke AF. And Yashamunk is a contributing editor at The Atlantic and professor at Johns Hopkins University. Thank you for being here. So... Heading into tomorrow, we know what the polls are saying, that Biden has a healthy lead. Danielle Moody, I would presume that makes you happy, but what's your confidence level? Um, I am cautiously optimistic. I do not want to get the sucker punch that I had in 2016 on the set of CBC uh, when Donald Trump won. So I think that folks still need, if you haven't voted, they need to go. Uh, and vote tomorrow. Tomorrow is the last day. Um, but 100 million people have voted already. And so that, to me, is what is probably most encouraging outside of what the polls are saying. So you're not the only Democrat I've heard say that they're nervous. And I know that Biden was not your choice as a candidate. What's your assessment of the campaign he's run? I think that he has run an incredibly solid campaign. I'm actually impressed. Um, folks know that he was not my first, second, third, or fifth choice. Um, but I think that he is the right person for this moment. And they didn't take anything, um, you know, uh, under assumptions. They went to every state. They did every type of ground game virtually um, and, you know, and physically that they could, uh, making up for the mistakes that Hillary Clinton made in 2016 and her campaign made in 2016. So, you know, I feel very proud um, of the ticket and think that they have done what they needed to get done. So, Daniel McCarthy, it's, it's, you know, when you listen to the president, he's extremely confident, but sometimes actions speak louder than words. He's spending a lot of time in places that otherwise might have been perceived as a lock for him. So, so how, how are you feeling right now? 
Well, you know, Donald Trump has also been spending time in uh, places like Michigan, which were not considered a lock and which seemed, according to many polls, to be a sort of double-digit lead for Joe Biden. So I think the uh, race is much tighter than it looked to be about two weeks ago. And uh, Republican enthusiasm is extremely strong. And that's going to be, I think, one of the key tests is whether you get an enormous Republican turnout tomorrow, as well as perhaps Donald Trump drawing to the polls people who've never voted before, some of whom, of course, will be against him, but many of whom may be non-voters who are actually energized by and supportive of the president. So very briefly, Daniel, how do you explain what you seem to be, what you seem to be suggesting is a shift there so that the polls are tightening for the last two weeks? What happened? I think a lot of it's been the fact that Donald Trump has been out there campaigning in person uh, with a really rigorous schedule, going across, sort of barnstorming the whole country, holding these large rallies, which, of course, uh, you know, people might have been afraid that uh, COVID would keep people away from them. But in fact, uh, it seems as if the enthusiasm is so strong for President Trump that people are not afraid and that they want to come out, support the president. And uh, it's really a source of great encouragement and uh, enthusiasm for Republicans. And I think that's going to be reflected in what we see in the polls and uh, on election day tomorrow. Yeah, sure. We need some perspective from you here. Uh, we've been bracing people really for a while to not expect results tomorrow night. What's your instinct on that? Um, well, so certainly in past years, you could expect the outcome of the election to be clear on the Tuesday. Um, uh, this year, because of the amount of uh, mail-in ballots and uh, the amount of time it'll take to count those ballots, it may take longer. Um, if the polls, which uh, actually continue to be very favorable to Joe Biden, turn out to be right, or if they are a miss, but it turns out that Joe Biden outperforms them, I think it is perfectly possible that we will have a result tomorrow. Um, but certainly nobody should be as surprised if it turns out to be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we still don't know uh, who the next president of the United States is going to be. And that doesn't mean that something bad is happening, just that the votes are being counted. But, but Daniel, you know, uh, Donald Trump continues to cast doubt on whether he will accept a losing result, if that's what happens tomorrow. As a Republican, what goes through you when you hear him say that? What goes through my mind is that the media is completely exaggerating something that Donald Trump is saying, usually as a way of trolling the media and their sort of irrational claims that he's not going to accept a defeat. That's ridiculous. Of course he will. And it's actually Democrats and progressives and Antifa who've been out on the streets causing bloodshed and rioting throughout the summer. If there's going to be any violence, if there's going to be any disruption of the election, it's going to be coming from the left. And that's why you see cities like Washington, D.C. having to board up their shops. You're not seeing that being done in small town America where you actually have very strong Donald Trump support. But you, you know, one of the things that's been striking in the last few years is, is to see the standards of public discourse and the standards of the conduct of office shift. I absolutely agree that Donald Trump sometimes jokes and the media takes him at his word. But it is absolutely irresponsible for the president of the United States to joke about the idea that he might not accept the election. And it is absolutely irresponsible for him to cheer on, as he did on Twitter a few days ago, um, people who uh, try to run off a Biden campaign bus uh, off the road in a way that the FBA now is investigating. So I'm a little shocked both by the president, by, by the behavior of the president, um, and by the way that Daniel talks about it. And, and Daniel, well, I'm shocked that Donald Trump can't seem to find it uh, in his, uh, you know, very vast brain to criticize all of the violence we've seen in the United States uh, okay. in our cities over the past summer. Yasha, what well, do you have to say well, about? Well, that? Hang on a well, second, everybody. Well, there's, there's, fact, an, there's enough rancor <laughs> south of the border. We're not going to do that here, Daniel. We don't have much time left. <laughs> Uh, I would like to ask you, what are you worried about beyond a result you don't want? Was that to me? Or yes, it was. To... Yeah, to Danielle. Oh, Moody. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, so th this back and forth is very interesting. Um, I, I think that, you know, the reality here is that stores are being locked down and people are stockpiling food because Donald Trump has told the Proud Boys and white supremacists to stand back and stand by, and people are terrified. To Yasha's point, like, it is, it, it, I don't know what kind of joking folks think that Donald Trump does, but he has not made a joke about this. He has been asked to clarify this point over and over again, and given the opportunity to clarify his statement on not leaving the White House, if and not conceding the election, it has been very, very clear about the fact that he has no intention of doing so. Okay, it's I... why there is a, a border and a fence outside of the White House right now. So I, I don't think that we should be, it, it should be made light of that the President of the United States for the first time in our history has said that he won't concede an election. All right, last question to Yasha Monk, if I may. What is the race, what is the state, 
What are you looking for particularly tomorrow? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of a horse race, I think Pennsylvania is going to be uh, the most important state. We will also get some early results from Florida and later in the night from Texas, which are going to tell us uh, a lot about the race. If Joe Biden uh, looks like he's winning either of those states, it's certainly game over. But mostly I'll be looking at uh, whether we know it on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, uh, the state of American democracy and whether we're able to um, defend against a real danger to American democracy. And that, in my mind, would be four more years of Donald Trump. All right, Yasha Monk, Daniel Moody, Daniel McCarthy, thank you very, very much. Uh, bon courage to all of you tomorrow. We will be right back with Americans bracing for a trip back to the future. Could tomorrow's election be a replay of Florida 2000? Oh, please no, where recounts and courts dragged it out for weeks. Welcome back. All the talk of preparing for not having a clear winner on election night, that's not a flight of fancy that comes from experience. This is the big warning from the Bush versus Gore battle of 20 years ago when ballot confusion in Florida led to recounts and a Supreme Court decision. But that tug of war isn't just history. Many worry Americans could now be destined to repeat it. Every vote from every citizen deserves to be counted. What the hell the movie the about the Florida madness of 2000 is called Recount. The haunting would have been a good name too. How hard is this to punch a paper ballot? It's pretty then confusing punch card ballots either registered the wrong vote, no vote, or two votes. Get your magnifying glass out. With Bush and Gore apart by just a few hundred votes, recounts were ordered. The protesters got louder as the results tightened. Gore must go! November 22nd, weeks after election night, with votes still meticulously being examined, a turning point. Republican operatives bellowing without evidence about voter fraud at the Miami-Dade election office. Arrest him! Arrest him! The man being screamed at and chased out, the Miami-Dade Democratic chair, Joe Geller. I literally thought at one moment there that I might be knocked down and maybe just stomped to death. He escaped unscathed. The election did not. Later that day, the recount was called off. That recount was canceled in Miami-Dade County because of violence, fear, and physical intimidation. Lawyers for both parties took the fight from there all the way to the Supreme Court. And with a 5-4 decision from a conservative-dominated bench officially stopping the recount, President-elect, United States. George W. George Bush became w. president. We thought that all of the stalling and delaying tactics that the Republicans employed were ridiculous. Sooner or later, they have to count all the ballots. Well, it turned out we were wrong. Wrong because there was and still is a deadline by which a state has to appoint those going to the Electoral College. Counting cannot drag on. So his warning, watch for parties trying to stall, he says, trying to get the courts involved. I think there's going to be many attempts to muddy the waters. He worries, too, about the streets. What's your sense of what protests in 2020 might look like in terms of a disputed election? I don't think we've moved in a positive direction. And we have someone in the White House who incites violence. The specter of violence is why businesses in D.C. are boarding up, some right at the offices of Republican Christopher Metzler, a conservative legal scholar who admits he's worried, too. If it is not a clear winner, America will have to batten down the hatches because they will be significant protests. The activism of the courts also bothers him. It was unprecedented in 2000. Unfortunately, over the last couple of years, the courts have been deciding political issues more than they should. As a constitutional scholar, it concerns me greatly. I don't care if it's uh, a Republican court or a Democratic uh, court. It, that is not the job of the courts. This is already the most litigated election in American history. 400 lawsuits and counting and election day hasn't even happened yet. The Supreme Court is already involved. If results are overwhelming, either way, litigation won't be an issue. But if it's tight, keep your eyes on mail-in ballots. From the standpoint of the average American voter, what we want to know is that our votes count. If people feel their votes did not count, it will permanently 
undermine uh, democracy. I fear for democracy in my country. Some parts of voting are better now in the United States. Punch card ballots in 2000 were so flawed they were abandoned. Ballots now are more accessible, the counting process more transparent. And the message is sinking in. This election may take a while to call, not because something's wrong, but because taking time to count means something's going right. So, Adrian, tell me, I mean, you were reporting from Florida in 2000 right. on the recount. What, what was your takeaway then? Well, it was a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> but 2000, the message was very clear. It taught us that details matter. Then it was, you know, are the chads hanging from one corner or two corners or three corners? That made a difference on whether a vote was counted. The margin of that election was the closest in history, one one-hundredth of one percent. Wow. So if you lock that into your head, remember, a full recount never happened. And so watch this as disputes begin. Is that signature matching? Is that okay? Was that envelope closed properly? Right. Those are the little details that could become a problem and could drag us out. Lost to watch for. Okay, a little later, Americans tell us why they're voting. But first, Johnny Depp loses his libel case against a tabloid that called him a wife beater. We look at what it could mean for future cases. Welcome back. Actor Johnny Depp has lost a libel case against a British tabloid newspaper that called him a wife beater. The judge said he believed the claims were, quote, substantially true. Renee Filipponi has more on that case and what the ruling might mean. What happened? The video played during the trial was used as evidence to prove Johnny Depp was violent along with images of a bruised Amber Heard who claims she was abused 14 times by the actor and feared for her life. The libel case was over this 2018 article in The Sun, labeling Depp a wife beater. The trial exposed disturbing details of the couple's marriage, with both taking the stand. Depp maintained he never hit her, calling it all an elaborate hoax. Today, the judge ruled that the article was substantially true, and that a majority of the alleged assaults had been proved to the civil standard. He believed very strongly in his right to vindicate himself and his reputation. This media lawyer says this ruling will have serious consequences for Depp and may impact future libel cases. It will make claimants think very carefully before entering into a libel action as to whether or not it's really worth it for them. In response to the decision, The Sun said domestic abuse victims must never be silenced and thanked Amber Heard for her courage in giving evidence to the court. To have this result, particularly now, just as we're about to go into a, another lockdown, I think sends a clear message to victims that actually do come forward. You will be believed, and for me, that's the most important thing. Johnny Depp's lawyers are calling the ruling perverse and bewildering and plan to appeal it. This isn't the only case looking at abuse allegations. Depp is also suing Heard in a U.S. court over an opinion piece she wrote about domestic violence. Heard's lawyers say they will be presenting more evidence against Depp there. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. And next on The National, American voters in their own words. We're going to hear from a few of them about who they're voting for and why. Next. When Americans cast their votes, as millions will tomorrow, any number of reasons will lie behind their choices. So tonight, on the eve of the vote, we wanted to hear from some of those Americans. Their thoughts are our moment. Heading into the 2020 elections, I feel empowered that I finally get to use my voice to cast a vote. I'm anxious, I'm hopeful. It's a lot of mix, it kind of swings every day. I am voting for Joe Biden. I'm actually feeling incredibly confident about this upcoming election. I will be voting for President Donald J. Trump as I believe he is the best candidate in this election. I am voting for my future. I believe that this election will come down to Florida and the Latino vote specifically. I'm proud to be voting for Joe Biden. I am voting for President Trump because I think he's the only one right now. He is the man that can bring our economy back. He may not talk slick, but he does a lot of action. As a black community, we need to vote. Everyone needs to vote. So many people have died because of 
trying to get the right to vote. And here we are, we have that right. I feel like if I don't vote in this election, I could lose my American dream because I believe that my vote will help America, Americans secure that American dream. It is so interesting to, to hear, you know, what's going on in their heads. It'll be so interesting to see what they do. The ballots tomorrow, elections are always great stories. Usually we know when they're going to end. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen. We usually know when, not this time. Yeah, tomorrow's election night, but, but it, I mean, you almost have to think of it like election week, election mm -hmm. month. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a, a spot stick there just behind that pillar where I put my sleeping bag. Perfect, good. <laughs> As I said, I've got there. the snacks. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> That is a national for November the 2nd. We'll see you here tomorrow night starting at 8 p.m. Eastern for America Votes. Good night.